just as James is concerned about our practice as much as what we believe, uh, he is also concerned with the words that come out of our mouth. So all of James 3 is devoted to a discussion of the way we talk. Now, since James seems so familiar with the teaching of Jesus in Matthew, uh, I thought maybe it would be helpful to run through some things that Jesus has to say about our speech, according to Matthew. Now, to do that, I've just simply run some word studies on English words. I entered some words in my search engine on my uh, computer Bible. Uh, word, speech, speak, say, talk. Uh, and so I'm just going to kind of walk through the verses that came up uh, in all of those. First of all, I, I put the word word in, and the very first thing that pops up is Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now that sort of sets the stage for what Jesus is going to say himself about our speech. It is the word of God that really matters, but it also shows the power of the fact that someone would speak whether it be God or whether it be human beings. Words really matter. The second one is in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7 where Jesus is instructing us about prayer. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Now I know this is not about regular human speech. This is about prayer and the way that sometimes religious approaches are about the way words are said to God, you know, the right formula or the right amount or the right, the right way they're said. But I think Jesus would also say that the volume of words that a person speaks really says nothing about the worth of what they're saying. It's not just the volume of words that indicate a person's piety or wisdom. Uh, you know, I think James gets into this a little bit where he says in James chapter 1 and verse 19, Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. Then in Matthew 12, verses 36 and 37, Jesus says, I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted, and by, their, uh, by your words you will be condemned. Now, this is the conclusion to the episode when the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting demons out by the power of Satan. Jesus, first of all, points out the illogical nature of their claim. Satan surely wouldn't undo his own work and work against himself like that. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Then he warns them in verses 31 and 32, And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, <clears throat> there are a lot of reasons you might be mistaken about the Son of Man. You can have wrong expectations. The, the disciples kind of went through this. They, they made a lot of mistakes about Jesus because they didn't understand exactly what he was all about. Uh, you might be in a bad mood that day. You know, Jesus comes and speaks to you, and you, you insult Jesus just because you're, you're feeling badly. Uh, you could simply just misunderstand what Jesus is trying to say. None of those are fatal errors. You can always change your mind. They don't indicate anything about a, a bad heart or a bad way of going about things. We could, we could someday just wake up and say, oh, silly me, how in the world could I ever have thought that? But to blaspheme the Spirit by calling the works that Jesus does evil is to move in a completely different sphere of thought. You know, in order to do that, your, your heart has to be absolutely corrupted. Uh, you have to not be able to tell the difference between good and evil. To call someone's healing evil is simply to indicate you don't even know what evil means. You don't even know what good means. How do you distinguish between the two? And so Jesus says, in essence, blaspheming the Spirit is having a mind or a heart that cannot recognize good when you see it. And that is a fatal condition that's unforgivable. Uh, you, you don't, you, you're never able to decide the truth about Jesus because you just simply can't tell the difference. You've, you've fallen into evil clutches so deeply that now everything to you is just simply evil. And so Jesus concludes in verses 33 through 37... Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. 
You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned. You see, the words you speak reveal what sort of heart you have, whether or not it is redeemable or if it is hopelessly corrupt. You'll be able to see how James uses this idea in his letter. The, the, the words you say are a lot like the works he talked about in James 2. Uh, they reveal the nature of what you actually believe and whether or not you intend to be holy. And you can't make excuses. I, I didn't mean to say that. Jesus knows that you did mean to say that, and you will be held responsible for it. Notice how Jesus condemns empty words. The words we say when our brains aren't in gear. The sort of stuff we just throw out, almost unthinking. The sort of stuff we think we can get away with because we can excuse it. Nope. I also ran the word say through my search engine, and I came up with this verse, Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Racha, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Again, I, I think what lies behind this is the fact that the words we speak reveal the heart that we have. To, to insult someone with these words of contempt are the same as murder in Jesus' eyes. We, we might as well have gone ahead and killed them. And so the words we say are, are very important, very central to the kind of life that we, that we actually live, or the kind of heart that we actually have, and not just the heart that we claim to have. Verses 33 and 37 again, You heard that it was said to the people long ago, Don't break your oath. But fulfill to the Lord all the vows you have made. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. The Pharisees were really concerned about the things we say that we later claim. I, I didn't mean that. And one of those times is when a man utters an oath before God. You are obligated to keep your oath. Now, the problems that arise with Corban oaths fall in here. Corban is, is an oath, it's a formula, a way of dedicating goods to the use of the temple. Uh, a man, for example, and this is covered in the Mishnah, a man, for example, gets angry with his father and says, Corban to anything I might have otherwise given you. That is, what he's saying is, anything I might have ever given to you is dedicated to the Lord instead. So he's saying to his father, I will not give you anything because if, if I ever thought about giving you anything, that is going to be dedicated to the Lord. So the Pharisees say, well, a man can never help his father again or else he'll have to give that money over to the temple. Now notice how that was said. The catch here is that the man doesn't actually have to give the money to the temple. He only is forbidden to give it to his father. Uh, you can see why Jesus thinks this is the most immorally silly thing he's ever heard. Uh, he says to the Pharisees, by your tradition, by your interpretation of the law, you are allowing a man to get away with cursing his father instead of demanding that he clean up his speech and actually fulfill the law by helping his father. Now in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus simply says, watch your tongue. Don't make any promises you can't keep. Just be a person of integrity and keep your word and refrain from having to make any sort of oath. So the real concern that Jesus has about what we say is how it reveals the inclination of our heart. Your talk is a faithful indicator of a bad or a good attitude toward God. Now James has already made two references to the way we talk, our speech, in his introduction in James chapter 1. He said in verses 19 and 20, My dear brothers and sisters, Take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. 
James seems to focus on our angry speech, these outbursts of anger, the things that we say to others when we are angry with them. Verse 26, then, he says, those who, this is James 1, verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Here is where it is really clear that James is in perfect harmony with Jesus. Your talk is an unfailing indicator of your true self, what your real values are, what your real faith is all about. Okay, having done that, let's walk through James chapter 3. First, I want to read the entire chapter to kind of get a feel for what James is telling us. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise, uh, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. James begins by talking about teachers. He continues by talking about how dangerous our speech can be. He then turns to discussing the contrast between earthly wisdom and God's wisdom. All of these are rooted in what he's introduced in the first chapter. He began by asserting that the wisdom we use to live must be God's wisdom. The way we make decisions about our life, the way we choose what we will do, have to be rooted in the wisdom of God and not just earthly wisdom. He says in verse 5 of chapter 1, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Sorry, my computer went haywire. He, he speaks of the dangers of our talk in chapter 1. He says in verse 19 of chapter 1, Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. A couple of other ideas pop up that James introduces in chapter 1 as well. Uh, instability. The tongue, he says, is a restless and in unstable evil. Chapter 3 and verse 8. And James has already warned us in chapter 1 that a double-minded person is unstable in all they do. Verse 8. That's the same Greek word. Restless and unstable are the same Greek word. He's talked about maturity or perfection. He says in verse 4 of chapter 1, that our trials are able to lead us to maturity if we persevere in them without doubting. Then in chapter 3 and verse 2, he says, controlling our speech is one of the requirements of becoming mature. A mature person is able to control his tongue. 
Now, remember, too, that James isn't just sticking ideas together without connecting them. Uh, he has, in James 2, spoken of the need for our deeds to match up with what we claim to believe about Jesus. Faith without works is dead, he says. He continues in James 3 with that same idea in the background. Uh, our speech has to match up with our profession of faith. Our talk is one of those deeds that reveals our faith as well as revealing the inclination of our true faith, what we actually believe in. Uh, maybe the best way to get at James 3 is to begin at the end. Those verses 13 through 18. Who's wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. James' big concern is wisdom and where we get it. There is a type of wisdom that comes from God. It is holy. It leads us to be uh, more like God. It builds community instead of tearing it apart. Then there is a type of wisdom that is earthly. It is marked by envy and ambition. Uh, James's big concern is wisdom and where we get it. There is a type of wisdom that comes from God. Uh, it's holy. It leads us to be more like God. It builds community instead of tearing it apart. And then there is a type of wisdom that is completely earthly. Uh, it, it's marked by envy and ambition. It, it rips apart the unity of the church. And it leads to a group that is marked by instability. Uh, a church that really doesn't know whose side it's on or doesn't really know how to act or what is appropriate in the given situation. And that's a real contradiction to the peacefulness and order that God offers us in a chaotic world. And it leads to every evil practice, as James puts it. The, the word evil in that phrase, every evil practice, is an adjective that indicates that whatever you're doing is way beneath you. You're better than that. You have been called to be something more than this. It isn't so much the, the, the filth of what's going on that disturbs James. Well, <laughs> it is. In James 1, he says, get rid of all of the filth that is so prevalent. But his concern here is for a group that can't recognize their dignity and their high calling. They are settling for being much less than God has made possible for them. Now, I'm going to return to those verses in a little while when we talk about how we can control our speech. But for right now, I just want to sort of shed some light on what James is saying at the beginning uh, of the chapter that, that leads to this particular summary. Clearly, he thinks teachers can be divisive in their teaching. And he also knows that the sort of things we say have great effects on the attitude of the church. Uh, it can be the things that we say to each other, you know, the put-downs, the outbursts of anger, uh, even when we think we're just standing up for ourselves, oftentimes we're being destructive. Uh, probably he is focused more, as far as teachers go, more on ambition and on getting my way. It, it can be the things we say to each other uh, about people outside the church as well. I can imagine teachers whipping the church up into a frenzy at the injustices that the rich people have done to them and manipulating these church members to arm themselves and even to assassinate these ungodly people. Now that's actually going on, and we'll talk about that when we get to James chapter 4. But, but teachers can really set the attitude of the church. Teachers can teach the church to be full of faith, to be focused on good works and hope, looking for ways to serve and share the message of Jesus. Or teachers can, by their sour approach to everything, highlight everything that's bad and evil about the world and about people who are not us, and the church becomes resentful and hateful and angry, just looking for ways to undermine people outside the church and glad that all those folks out there are going to the hell that they deserve. James says, 
verse 1 of chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. In those societies that James is familiar with, teachers were people who had some status. They were respected. They were called rabbi. They were called teacher. They were called father. They expected to be greeted in holy places as holy men. Uh, they were invited to the best banquets, and they were given the places of honor. Uh, probably they even made money out of their teaching. People were willing to support them. Now, Jesus has already warned about the dangers of ambition that can easily become the motivation for a person wanting to be a teacher. Matthew chapter 23 then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the places of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, teachers. For you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And none of this, neither what Jesus says nor what James says, none of this means that people should not ever aspire to be teachers. But it does mean that they should not base their desire on the ambition to be respected or exalted in any, in, in any way. Teaching should be an humbling profession that, that is focused on bettering the lives of others instead of winning personal accolades. And so James says, you better take your teaching position very seriously because you will be judged for how and what you teach. Now this leads James to a more general discussion of the uh, dangers of what we say and how we say it. Uh, you remember that he's already spoken about this a little bit. He says in chapter 1 and verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Now one thing we need to remember about what James is telling us in James 3, especially in this little section we're going to look at right here, James is exaggerating. That's a pretty common way for Jews to teach, to exaggerate the dangers of something in order for us to take it seriously. And so he is going to make it sound like we cannot ever hope to control our tongues, even though the whole point of what he's trying to make is that we must control our tongues. Uh, he will describe the dangers of the tongue in the most extreme ways, as though the tongue is the most dangerous thing you've ever seen, as though the tongue is at the root of every evil that's in us. Although it's clear that the problem lies in our hearts and not so much in our tongues, our speech is not the cause of our ungodliness, but it's an expression of it. So James will start off really big in uh, the next verse. He will say, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Now, he, he builds up the importance of what we say by making it seem that the way we talk is everything. Now, clearly, that's not true, because in James 2, he has already said, you can talk all you want to, but if you don't back it up with deeds, big deal. The problem that confronts James's church is anger, and their talk both expresses their anger and also leads them to be even more angry. They are talking themselves into being angry, and so he wants them not to dismiss his instruction about the way they talk to each other and about each other. If you can get this under control, he says, you will be well on your way to solving every problem you have. 
Now remember, we talked about anger a few weeks ago. One way to handle anger and to keep it from being long-lasting and destructive is to stop talking about being angry. Uh, stop telling your story of injustice to everyone you meet. Stop dwelling on how angry you are and how you were mistreated and how you were wrong. And lo and behold, anger dissolves. What James says is true. A mature person has learned to control his tongue. It is the immature person who blurts out everything he or she may be thinking or feeling. And, and it takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of discipline and a lot of experience to get control of your emotions and your impulses so that you say what is helpful and not what is harmful. Be slow to speak, says James. Now, the effect of the things we say are not easily dismissed. Verses 3 through 5, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Now, it looks at first glance like James is telling us that the tongue has control over the entire way we act. But that's not his point. What he means for us to hear is look how great an effect what you say can have. Just like a small bridle turns this huge horse or a small rudder turns a big ship, the tongue boasts of great things. In other words, it claims to be able to accomplish huge things, and the, the tongue is has the possibility of, 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 of accomplishing these great things, and mostly what it does, though, is start fires. So James points out the tongue, what we say, does not have the effect that we think it has a lot of the time. We think that when I throw my weight around, when I yell at somebody, when I tell them off, I think I'm accomplishing something good. There, I told him. There, I stood up for that. There, I, I did something good. Actually, James says, what you're doing is destroying beyond repair. He says, verse 6, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. When we think we're standing up for us ourselves by aggressive speech James says you're actually headed straight for hell so James underscores the danger of our speech and he does this again by exaggerating the power of the tongue he says in verse 7 and 8 all kinds of animals birds reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind but no human being can tame the tongue it's a restless evil full of deadly poison now, clearly, James is exaggerating. James is not trying to say, no matter what you do, you can't tame your tongue. Because the whole point of what he's saying already is, you better tame your tongue. But what better way to catch our attention, to, to establish the real dangers of what we say, than picturing the tongue as this uncontrollable snake that just darts in and out of our mouth, striking helpless people dead with this deadly poison. And he says, it takes real effort to control what you say. It isn't easy, and you have to work at it. Now, he wraps up his warning about our speech by pointing out the, the inconsistency of claiming to honor God while dishonoring other people with what we say. Verse 9, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Now, a couple of things here. One, the inconsistency that we fall into when we curse people but try to praise God at the same time. Second, the fact that what we say reveals the real nature of our hearts 
we may claim to hold no grudges. We may claim to harbor no resentments or to say that we have no hatred in our hearts. But what we say and the way we actually say it reveals that we actually do. Bitter words reveal a bitter heart. Angry words reveal an angry heart. Careless words, those words that we just kind of throw off without thinking, reveal a heart that really doesn't care nearly as much as we claim to care about what God thinks and about his ways of living. And so then, on to the summary in verses 13 through 18 that we've already discussed. So, okay, if, if we've got to control our speech, how do we do it? I think the answer is in verses 17 and 18. The wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. First of all, we must be pure. The word actually is more like holy. I, I think James is talking about our attitude, about our approach to living, the way that we think about things in general. Uh, you remember Paul will say in Philippians 4 and verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We need to get our eyes off corrupted things of the world and focus on the ways and the blessings of God. You know, when all we can see is how things have gone wrong, how the world isn't good, when, when all we notice is how people have failed us and failed in general, then we tend to become sour and bitter and negative, angry. So become pure. Stop accentuating the negative and start focusing on the positive. Secondly, we must be peace-loving. What promotes good feelings and peace? You know, a lot of us, without even realizing that we're doing it, we love to keep the pot stirred. As long as people are agitated, as long as people are on edge, uh, you know, we, we just like to get a rise out of people. And we do it, wisecrack, sarcasm, aggressive confrontation. And then we wonder, why, why is everybody just angry all the time? Again, we're going to return to Paul. This is Romans 12, verse 14 through 18. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Thirdly, we need to be considerate. Uh, the word indicates a willingness to forgive and to let bygones be bygones. Now, it's true that there are times when someone does something to us that is so hurtful, so huge, so dangerous that we just can't ignore it. And we have to work through a process of reconciliation. We have to work through hard feelings. And we have to expect change from the one who has hurt us and not allow them to do that dangerous thing again. Most of the time, though, it's not that serious. We simply need to grow a thicker skin and stop taking ourselves so seriously. Most of the time, it just doesn't matter. Yes, they may have said something stupid. Yes, they may have done something offensive, but does it really matter? You know, if you ignore it, will it just be a bump in the road? Uh, or, or will it always be there to be, to be digested? It takes maturity to know the difference, but, but there is a sense in which we need to, to kind of be able to distinguish between when it's not very serious and when it's hugely serious. And most of the time, it's not very serious, and we need to learn to deal with that. We need to be submissive. The word in Greek is actually obedient. Now, James doesn't mean that we must allow others to tell us what to do or to tell us how to think or tell us how to feel. What it means is we need to be easy to get along with. Let someone else take the lead once in a while. Be cooperative adjust, trust other people, learn to trust other people. 
know what can never be compromised and, and never compromise on it, but also learn what things actually don't matter and learn to get along. Now, there's maturity for you because a mature person, that's kind of the activity of a mature person. We must be full of mercy and good fruit. James connects these two, so uh, they must go together in some way. Uh, we need to cut people some slack. We need to treat them with as much consideration and forgiveness as we would like for others to treat us. Somebody needs to write that down somewhere and put it in an important place. Do it to others as you would have them do to you. Uh, we, could call it, uh, we could call it the golden rule. You know, we need to promote good fruit. If, if all we leave in our wake is dead people, hurt people, angry people, eventually it ought to dawn us on us the fault does not lie with them but maybe with us we need to be full of mercy and good fruit we must be impartial now that word is sort of misleading in our english translations uh, the word as james uses it has more to do with undoubting or unwavering we need to make up our minds are we going to persist in being worldly and judging our actions by worldly standards or are we going to drop our self-promotion and be on God's side? Are we going to let Him tell us how to act, and are we going to do the hard work of repenting and do the even harder work of disciplining ourselves? You know, we, we try to let ourselves off the hook, but this is just the way I am. Uh, this is just the way I was raised. This is, this is what feels right. None of that matters. What God says and what God wills for us, that is the important thing. We must be sincere. The word is the opposite of hypocritical. We must live without pretense. You know, we're always trying to make ourselves look better than we actually are. We're trying to make people treat us better than we actually are. We need to just calm down, enjoy where we are and who we're with, and treat people with an attitude of sincere goodwill, and stop playing games and trying to protect something that we know we are we are not. I have a friend who hurts because he doesn't have friends, or he thinks he doesn't have friends. Uh, he actually does, but he can't recognize it because all he can see is how people are failing him, and all he can talk about is how people have wronged him. I, I finally asked him one day, are you trying to be somebody that nobody wants to be around? Or would you rather be someone who is pleasant, someone that people want to be with and someone who wants that that people want to include in the things that they do you know he's done such a good job of being hard to get along with that it's going to take a long time for people to get comfortable with him he's going to have to prove himself to them but but that really is the issue we can use our tongues to destroy our relationships and prove ourselves to be ungodly or we can use our tongue to build others up and build relationships and be godly people and that's what James teaches us about our tongues. The way we talk to others, the way we talk about others, really important, really vital. Thank you.